open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yeah, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Aaron Williams. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We are radio for the local craft beer movement, broadcasting from our home away from home, Monday Night Brewing in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm Aaron Williams. And I'm Tim Dennis. We got Brian Hewitt with us here today as well. And today we have a very special guest joining us on the show is Stan Hieronymus. Stan, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Mm. Now, if you're not familiar with Stan Mm -hmm. Hieronymus, then you should be. Stan is a beer author. He's been writing since 1993. Actually won the North American Guild of Beer Writers Writer of the Year Award in 1999. He's written hundreds of articles for scores of publications and published eight books including Brewing Local and For the Love of Hops. All right. That's a lot of books. We're very thrilled to have you here today. Looking forward to geeking out with you some on on the show. Yeah, we've actually got like a beer expert here. This is pretty exciting. So unlike us two schlubs, exactly. That's right. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, you know, we're also going to go ahead and talk about the second annual Columbus Beer Bash. We'll uh, be interviewing the founder of that. And also we'll have your chance to win a membership in the Sweetwater Woodlands Circle. Absolutely. Which is pretty sweet. It's a very cool club. Definitely, definitely. We're in it. We are. Even though it's... Even if those are cool people, we're still in it, right? That's definitely it. So, yeah. So speaking of which, uh, you know, we uh, had a pretty pretty busy week, actually. You know, the week before, of course, we broadcasted at Day of the Juice. I think I remember that. I remember most of it. I'm most, most of, of it, it, too, yes. That we was... recorded it, so anything <laughs> yeah. we we could forget. That so. is definitely true. So, yeah, we certainly uh, had a great uh, great day there. A ton of fantastic beers. Uh, again, if you're an IPA lover, you're an IPA heaven. So, Brian and I were quite happy about uh, some of the great beers. It was delightful. Yes, yeah. Definitely. And then, of course, speaking of delightful, we had a little bottle share at Ironmonger Brewing up in Marietta, Georgia. The fine folks there allowed us to kind of use their barrel room, and uh, we had a little Patreon uh, party for we did. our supporters. So Say cool. thanks to our Patreon supporters. We had a good time. Absolutely. And speaking of, we have a brand new one to say hey to. And Joey Spain, thank you so much for being our latest Patreon supporter. And if you want to go ahead and uh, possibly do that, we've got some swag and some cool stuff for our, our uh, Patreon members. Uh, just head to uh, Beer Guys or Patreon.com slash Beer Guys. So that's uh, going to go ahead and uh, take you to that and we'll uh, check it out. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Very eloquently said. Oh, yeah, right? I, listen, I so am the much. king of yes. eloquence. Yes. I know, that's always key. Well, you know, my week, I continued my mission to visit every brewery in Georgia. Brian and I did. It's a co-mission. We're, we're co-pilots on this mission. Every brewery in Georgia in 2018. So we had a few more last weekend. We went to a Park Tavern, one, amazingly enough, that I'd never been to in all the years I've been in Atlanta. Yeah. And so, and I'm going to say this. Park Tavern doesn't get much love from the from the beer crowd here Mm -hmm. you know pretty basic beers and that uh, not even not much love some people speak poorly of it i had a blast there you go i had a blast now their beer was not earth shattering but they had a porter that was really nice i could drink several of now here's the very cool thing we went on a day where it was calling for rain Mm -hmm. and when it their slogan is when it rains we pour beers were a dollar pints of house beer for a dollar so for a grand total of about ten dollars we sampled every beer there and you know gave a little tip chatted with the bartenders chatted with the the owner there and had a good time yeah. so we also went to gordon beer down in buckhead uh pontoon we had a trip over there to sample their combustible pineapple pineapple lactose ipa that's really good yep. and we went up to stone mountain brewery have okay. you ever been up there uh, i've been there before it was a brewery so okay I, yeah. so i went there last time i was there for the brewery i think brian was about two years ago after peach straight brewing competition okay and uh you know i have nice things to say about every brewery yes that's, I can't say anything great about Stone Mountain. Okay. So the beers, they have some flaws that really need to work out. So hopefully they can get it fine-tuned mm-hmm. uh, because the, the food's good. The yeah, environment's they nice. They have Raclette, which Your I'm favorite. a fan yes. of that. So, uh, but yeah, some good German beer and German food would be nice, but uh, the beers need some polish Gotcha, there. gotcha. So. Brian, you've got a big list as well. Oh, yeah. It, it, you know, the pontoon thing, which I think I have a can here, and we might just open one of those combustible pineapple, but they had a bunch of IPAs that they teased us with. That Milky Way Galaxy Double IPA, Space Ghost, uh, Brudio 54, I think I'm saying that right. Sure. And... Uh, Hazy River, which I think was actually an IPL, and those were all really, That's right. really interesting. Yeah. Um, and I gotta give a shout out to Ironmonger, the Pentatonic and the Steam Breather Dip were both. They were tasty. nice. I, yeah. I really you know enjoyed that Steam Breather. You're right. Those yeah. are two breweries that are really starting to tune in. 
You know, yeah. they're you they're steadily getting better, which is something. Anytime a new brewery opens up, if you try them, give them a little while. You yeah. know, don't don't automatically start trashing them out of the gate if you don't care for what they're doing. Uh, these guys are you know learning their systems, dialing in there. Yeah, and it does take time. You know, it does. again, you get brand new systems. You're coming up from maybe a home brewing or a smaller pilot system. And then all of a sudden you're brewing 30 barrels. There's a lot of difference in efficiency and ingredients. Yes. ingredients. To make yeah, some so. of those home brews that you made on a big system, it gets expensive. Yeah. That's true. Some of those ingredients, suddenly yeah. they get yeah. really, really spendy. The, the ounces of hops turns to pounds, and then, yes. well, right. <laughs> that's not good. Stan, anything interesting or exciting for you the last week? We uh, did have dinner at Wrecking Bar mm-hmm. last Friday night. Nice. And okay. for usually you go in there, I love that you can get the short pours there. Yes. And so you can drink multiple beers. But speaking of short pours or beers that are cheaper... When you're paying a dollar a beer, what are you tipping per beer? I typically do. My standard is about a dollar a drink. Yes. is kind of the way yeah. I do it. So that's that's kind of that's that's my standard. A dollar a drink. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's so you go to the Czech Republic. Not we've fifteen done that cents. Before. So yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and the Czech Republic, you end up tipping more than you pay. Okay. Sometimes. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Huh. But but also back to. Um, the Cloudy Beer Festival. Sure, the uh, Day of the Juice Festival. Day of the yep. Juice. So did you have Narrow Gauge? I did have Narrow Gauge, yes. Yeah, so I thought it was I thought it was fantastic. So yeah, again, I think Jeff really, he, he works harder water than anybody I know on doing these beers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, that's that's one of the things about St. Louis I definitely miss is his beer. All right, let's go ahead and check out this week's Truck and Taps Beers of the Week. Crack open a cold one. It's the Truck and Tap Beer of the Week. Woo-hoo! Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Okay, Tim, what do we got? We have an excellent sampling here of lots of beers. So we got one that I think a lot of people are excited to see coming back around. Monday Night Brewing Space Lettuce. Yes. So that's a good one that we're going to get into. Uh, we have Wrecking Bar's Jimmy Stout. We have a Bearded Iris. Brian, what's that one called, the Bearded Iris? Oh, it's Tunnel Vision uh, Double Iris. Dry Hop with Citra. Double dry hopped, yes. They're yes. doing that. So we also have a uh, Van de Kaiser Blau, I believe. Look at you getting Did, get did I fancy. say that correct? Yes. This is, so uh, 2013 that okay. Brian brought from his beer cellar. We have from the Woodlands Project, the Woodlands Circle, we have release number four, which is their mixed fermentation Goza aged in Añejo tequila barrels. All right. That we're going to check out. I brought a homebrew that I discovered in my closet, a Synesthesia American, which is a American farmhouse cell with Britannomyces. Okay. And it from 2015. And a friend of mine, Jimmy, that I met, in a brewery in Jackson, Mississippi at mm-hmm. Lucky Town. Happened to take a trip to Atlanta during Day of the Juice and brought me a couple home brews that I brought along. Nice. With. So, Excellent. We look forward to checking them that's out. That's what then. we got going on. Cool. Let's uh, go ahead and check out this week's headlines. What's in the news? The beer guys have the scoop. Extra, extra, read all about it. Time for headlines. So the big news this week that I'm seeing everywhere is craft beer growth statistics telling us interesting things about craft lagers and light ales. And the spoiler is, lager and light ale is growing at a rate that is outpacing other styles. So craft beer growth in general slowed from 5% in 2017 from 13% in 2015. That's a considerable slowing. But craft lager sales in that same period grew 21.5%, and light golden ales grew a, an astonishing 37.5%. And uh, if you compare that to... Uh, uh, IPAs, you're looking at just 14% growth in the past year. So the interesting thing is breweries with a stronger lager and Pilsner presence were generally posting greater gains or just good gains in 2017, including Bell's Stone with their new lager, Firestone Walker, New Glarus, and Victory. And uh, even Founders, which is not technically craft anymore, saw 34% sales growth in the last year, crediting all-day IPA, which accounts for 60% of their total sales. And they also have that new gold, I think they have in 12 Packs, yeah, right? yeah. That, yeah, and that that hasn't even figured in. So eighty two percent, twenty four packs. I'm sorry. 20, yes. yes, that's right. And a lot of these guys are doing these bucks. exactly. They're putting eighteen these, bucks for a twenty four pack from Founders. No yep. kidding. <laughs> wow. And the thing is, is up until this point, big beer owns light lager, yeah. own light ale, own session, everything. And it's easy to take a little bit away from 100%. Yeah. You just put it in a big case, people see an option, and boom, I mean, there you go. You know, you always see like in the grocery stores, you've got like the one side of the aisle of the gross, of the cold beer aisle is the craft, and then it kind of drifts over, and then it becomes the, the macro brews. And so maybe if some of the micro or some of the uh, more crafty beers like, like Founders will start kind of drifting over into that drifting section as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you mentioned Founders with this. I think it was two or three years ago, their, I think it's called their back stage series 2014 i looked it into was it 14 okay. to center it's an uh an IPL. ipl ipl 
And that was the first one they released out of that Bagwood series that sat on shelves. Mm-hmm. You know, those ba- those are normally ones that really fly off the shelf, but I guess people saw IPL and, and didn't touch it. I wonder if they released that again now. Yeah, they might come back. Out. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So we got to wrap up, Ryan. We got to cut the news a little short here. We did some extra chatting in the first segment, yep. but you're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We were at Monday Night Brewing talking to Stan Hieronymus, and we'll be back right after this. Craft Beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their taproom in Marietta to taste and see. Also, visit their barrel room with an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I meant to do that. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. And welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. BeerGuysRadio.com, Facebook, and Twitter. If you missed part of the show or you just want to relive it, because who wouldn't, just head to iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, leave us a review. It really helps more people to find us. But in the meantime, we are back at Monday Night Brewing in Atlanta, Georgia. We are talking to author, home brewer, Beer journalist Stan Hieronymus, and in the break we got a master class on gozes. That we was did. fantastic. You know what? Uh, check in a check in a week or two on our YouTube channel because yeah. we're we're recording this and we, we have extra out, content. We'll put it uncut. Ooh, it's or exciting. pseudo cut. Kind of. We screwed up a couple times. We'll get rid of that. <laughs> That's right. So. Exactly. But once again, Stan, thanks for coming to the show. We've had some great conversation on the break here. Uh, that definitely, I think. Is worth checking out on YouTube and yeah. checking out. But uh, uh, you recently just relocated to our fair city of Atlanta from uh, St. Louis. So uh, how's the move going? What do you think of our town so far? Well, you know, it is early April, and we have a garage. Okay. So our cars are not green, <laughs> and the temperature is not terribly right. high. Yes. So, And we, we pretty much... Aside from coming here this evening, we don't get out in the traffic that often. So That's all these things the that are, yeah. are not that cool about Atlanta, we haven't had to mess with. So we get, get the cool stuff, what we can walk to, what we can take MARTA to, um, and we're having a great time exploring. Awesome. So any standout breweries for you so far or beers here? In- well, we, we live close to Wrecking Bar. Okay. Wrecking yep. Bar is really nice. Obviously, um, we like, we, I, I've known Mitch Steele for 20-plus years. And the beers there are outstanding. The view there is outstanding. Um, and this is New Realm Brewing. It's New just Realm, opened in Atlanta. Yes. Yep. The, and I was really happy to see their Pilsner going to cans. Mm-hmm. Before we moved here, I was uh, two and a half miles from Urban Chestnut, and their Stomtisch won the pace tastings for Pilsners. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think it deserves that. So to come here and be able to get both the New Realm Pilsner in cans and Creature Comfort's Bebo in cans. To go to the soccer games, walk in within like 20 feet, we chose the right gate, <laughs> and I've got New Realm in my hands. We're walking around, checking out the stadium. At the moment, I take my last sip, I look over, and there's Bebo on tap See? as well. Well, you know what? We're going to geek out a little bit here this week, and we normally keep it uh, a little lighter, appeal to a not-so-geeky crowd and that, but... This week, no, go for it. Tune I'm just going to sit back and drink beer. In. So yes, we're going to exactly. drop some not, or we're not going to drop the knowledge. That's so we're going to let Stan drop the exactly. knowledge. Exactly. But uh, we're going to talk a lot about hops. So, and uh, Stan, you've been a, a beer writer for 25 years now, night and day in the beer world in the last 25 years. So, with the big changes in the beer world, uh, what's that meant for you as a beer writer? What's changed for you as a writer over the last 25 years? <laughs> Um, From my standpoint, what's evolved is I've gone from uh, my wife and I, we're in England in 1994 using the Good Beer, Good Pub Guide to get around. And we go, there's nothing like this in the United States. So we started cataloging uh, the best places to drink in the country. Uh, There there were people just doing brew pubs, but it was a combination of saying, hey, look, there's beer being made and you can go to tap rooms like taco mac at the time Mm -hmm. right that was really our focus was finding the good places to drink beer we did a couple books based upon that what's evolved from there 
at some point in time, I became the guy who writes about technical stuff. It was, the niche was very small. Now it's a lot bigger. And so if I want to go learn new things about dials and hops, there's actually a sport group for that that will pay money to learn about it. Very cool. Now, were you into the technical side of things before you started writing about it or just someone that enjoyed good beer? We homebrewed at the time. So there's enough, you know, there there are things you've sort of got to figure out to homebrew. But in terms of the depth of technical, no. (laughs) Okay. Now, one of your recent books, or perhaps your most recent, For the Love of Hops? Uh, Brewing Local is the most recent. Okay. For the Love of Hops. uh, For the Love of Hops, super technical. Uh, Above my intelligence level as a a novice home brewer, but just some phenomenal information in there. And I have a friend uh, down in Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, that is engineer, scientist, geek, home brewer. You know, to him, it's it's phenomenal. But there's a lot of great info in there and a lot of things I wouldn't think of. So uh, hops are, I've seen a lot of changes over the last couple of years. What are some of the newest developments, exciting things happening in the world of hops? People are, are trying to figure out ways to get more out of them. So you have a little more than a year ago, uh, YCH Hops, Yakima Chief Hop Union merged together to create YCH Hops. They started with a cryo powder, originally available only to commercial breweries. Uh, but now available to the home brewers. And, and it's not a totally new process that's happened before, uh, but you have to get your hops super cold and get rid of a lot of the green matter. So it makes it easier to use um, a boatload of, since, since we're in a public place, a boatload of hops. Sometimes there's a different word in front of load. Um, <laughs> Same in, meaning, in, in though. Your, right? in, you yes. mean hop load, right? Yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. Now, still not quite there. Okay. Um, and because people want to load up, and what they're trying to do is load up on the essential oils on those hops, what's a, the lupulin mm-hmm. powder, which is, and now what we're learning is much more about the essential oils and, and thinking about the, uh, if we're going to geek level, we're thinking about the sulfur compounds. And these, these sulfur compounds exist in the hops. Uh, so some of them, just the, the shorthand for them are 4 MMP. Except if you're a wine person, then it's 4-SMP, same compound. 3-MH, 3-MHA, and most recently 4-SMP. So these compounds, which are thiols, exist at levels, for instance, that are basically a a pinhead in a swimming pool. And you can perceive them at that level. Okay. They've been in hops since American hops got involved. Hops are about 5 million years old, um, maybe a million and a half years ago. Um, they, so they originated in Mongolia. A million and a half years ago, some of them said, we're out of here, and they marched down to Europe. Th- those are what we think of as the classic hops. Mm-hmm. Saas, Genghis hops. Powertow, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Herzbrucker. Um, those varieties, all land race hops, uh, floral, that they have all these friendly qualities. About 500,000 years later, the other ones matriculated over and came into North America. Those hops are a little bit more American. You know, they're sure. in your face. They're bold. Um, they have, it turns out they have certain uh, essential oils like geranial that you don't get in the European hops. And they have a lot more of the sulfur compounds. Is there, you know, I know as a home brewer, 90% of the time all you're looking at is alpha acids, you know, as a home brewer. But there's, as I delved into trying to make my beer better, brewers suggest I look at things like uh, cocumulin levels and different things like that. Are there compounds that brewers really should be, even on a homebrew level, should be looking at more than what we are right now? Right now, it depends what you're trying to make. Um, if, if you're looking to make IPAs and a fruity IPA, then you're looking at levels of geranial which is like geranium, and Cascade is the first prominent hop with that. And then you're looking at 4-MMP, which is the thiol or the compound. You put those two together, that's when you get tropical. I'm curious, is there any, how much does the tawar figure into the hops? Mm -hmm. Because I know there's a species of hops and there's interbreeding. Is it all the species of hops, or is it, or does the, the, the natural environment that it grows in, how much of an effect does that actually have on what the hops do? So that's a matter of epigenetics. And you can take that same hop and and plant it, for instance, uh, in the Yakima Valley and Cascade and plant it in Germany. And those oil compounds are going to be quite different. So it's based upon the underlying genetics remain the same, but where it is grown makes a, a, a large difference. Not as large a difference as when it is picked and how it is handled during picking. Those will be the two new things. And 
for home brewers, boy, it's really hard to know what comes of that. And right. for a lot of small brewers as well. Cool. We're talking to Stan Hieronymus, and we'll uh, talk to him in a little bit more here coming up uh, um, a little bit after the break. But first, uh, the park at Georgetown will be a unique collection of restaurants, along with a craft brewery located within the new J.W. Holmes luxury development, Dunwoody Green. Conveniently located less than a half a mile from 285, this enclave of restaurants will be the gathering place in Dunwoody. Whether meeting old friends or making new ones, the park at Georgetown will be the place to share a great meal and build lasting memories. If you're planning to open a brewery or a brew, or a brew pub, one of those two things, the park at Georgetown may be your new home. Crimin Associates, the developer of the park at Georgetown, wants to talk to you. For more information, call Stephen St. Paul at 404-256-2960, extension 5. That's Stephen St. Paul, 404-256-2960, extension 5. And you listen to the Bear Guys Radio Show. We'll be back shortly to talk more with Stan Hieronymus after this. Aaron and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock and Alpharetta are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Aaron. See, they've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, well, that's when it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks daily, so that way you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and coming soon to Duluth in 2018. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. And welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. BeerGuysRadio.com is our website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. But now, Tim, we've got a very special segment. We have a special segment here that we like to call Sucking Up to South Dakota. That's right. <laughs> so that's. Uh, did you guys know that our show has listeners in every single state except one? South Dakota. South Dakota. Yep. So we got listeners in Hawaii, Alaska, Idaho, Maine, but not one single person in South Dakota has ever turned into the Beer Guys Radio Show. And What's I, up with I, don't, that? I don't get it. Yeah. Because South Dakota is an awesome state. Did you know their name comes from the Sioux Indian, meaning allies or friends? I do now. Yes. And did you know about their amazing and important state insect, the honeybee? So, okay. you know, and who can forget the awe inspiring Mount Rushmore? I've been there. South I Dakota have too. is yes. a wonderful state. So, and lots of famous people hail from South Dakota, like Tom Brokaw, Cheryl Ladd, and the 38th vice president of these United States, Hubert Humphrey. Okay. So, and when it comes to craft beer, things are really looking up for South Dakota. There are currently over 20 craft breweries in the state, and several more are on the way. Brewers in South Dakota had their hands tied a little bit with a limit of only 5,000 barrels of annual production. But thanks to the passage of SB 173, that cap has been raised to 30,000 barrels, and they even allow self-distribution up to 1,500 barrels a year. What? Yes. So we know here in Georgia what better beer laws mean. They're going to see more breweries and more brewery jobs. Okay. So it's easy to see, Aaron, why South Dakota is an awesome state, and I'm confident with careful keyword placement in this week's show description notes, they'll be tuning in to the Beers Guys radio show in no time. Note to self, yes. So I say cheers to South Dakota. Cheers, South Dakota. Cheers. There you go. Hey, we're back uh, from the Beer Guys radio show with uh, Stan Hieronymus, uh, journalist, author, home brewer, beer drinker, raconteur. I don't know if he's a raconteur or not. but now, uh, You know what? We're going to go back to something because, Stan, I love talking with you. We go on forever. We go to break and we bring up some topics. If you don't mind, I'm going to have you repeat something we just talked about. Because there was an article that went around recently. They were talking about yeast manipulation and gene splicing and all this crazy stuff to replace hops in, uh, in beer. And they were saying that the big uh, benefit, I guess, to it was saving water, crops, and that. So tell us about that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first I'll say something nice about them, um, which is any research is good. We can learn things from them. This could be a supplement. But the idea that it's going to replace the hops doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, the test beers that are referred to in the article are made with hops for bittering. Um, you know, it's not just the bitterness that comes from hops. You could replace that, but also the hops uh, provide microbial defense right. for the mm -hmm. beer. So all, all these things, also the, the, it's foam that's in hops uh, that the hops provide. All these things are important. It isn't going to do that. But even the flavor, what they've done is they've identified Two compounds, very important compounds. We talked before about the importance of geraniol. 
So is linalool. You put those together, you get some additional fruitiness. But a key driver in that is the thiols, and they haven't figured out a way to replicate the thiols. Uh, but the biggest thing for them is it, there has to be a really good reason for people to begin to use GMO yeast. Right. It is GMO. Mm-hmm. And now one of the things that uh, people have kind of talked about over, over the past uh, really several months and s- several years is the hop shortage. Is that real? And is that something that people c- should be concerned about uh, when doing these things? Um, well, right now we're at a hop surplus. Okay. So you, you and, and certainly in terms of the, I mean, people are still going to struggle to get, say, Citra. Mm-hmm. Um, or Galaxy, uh, Nelson Sauvin. Uh, but overall, of the aroma hop varieties, as people learn to use these and begin to understand what the parts are so you could assemble them in a different way, there's plenty out there. If there's going to be a shortage, it'll be because the largest breweries do not like to contract on a long-term basis. So if, if all of a sudden those alpha hops that we're talking about that people are using, that's the bitterness, people are using those, people not well, they are the people at the breweries. Um, the breweries are using those in a way that you don't actually notice them because international loggers have about eight BUs, but they're super important. Those, they are just skating by. Last year in Germany, they had a severe drought, and we've begun to rely on the Germans to provide most of the alpha hops. It's a hop called Hercules. You see it in the field. It's phenomenal. It looks like a hop tree. It's cones from top it's just it, you you think when you've seen pictures of hops they sort of go narrower like a christmas mm-hmm. tree this is straight up and down cones clear to the bottom it's a phenomenal producer hercules had it come in it came in short but they got rain at just the right time of july so it wasn't super short otherwise it would have been those people would have come in like 2007 and they would have been buying up all those rom- roma hops and grinding them up to use them for alpha and 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 brewers and home brewers who use them for aroma and flavor just would have been crying. So is there a an issue cuz we've heard hop shortage cried, you know, out yeah. there. Is it just maybe certain varietals that the the high demand ones there's plenty of hops it's just you may not get this or that. Right. Okay. So it, it it's certainly varietal like I said naming the ones uh, Galaxy last year short Galaxy continues to be something that's hard but but in Australia they they keep planting more of it mm-hmm. and they're trying to get caught up. Okay. Well that's no, the thing we, because it's it's not current demand it's they're planting for the future. So 2 3 years ago when they were kind of planting they didn't necessarily think that it was going to be, be hot what's going to be popular. Exactly. Yeah, they, yeah. they they try and and the Bruce Association is is really working at signaling to hot farmers so they understand where the demand's going to be. But as people, for instance, and and this is just going on to research, to look at certain varieties and understand what's different about them so maybe you could find a a substitute for a Nelson Sauvin, for instance. So uh, on on that line, Stan, I read in your Hop Queries newsletter about blending hops to kind of replicate other other hop profiles. Is that a possible way to address some of these shortages of the popular ones? Is uh, How's the research going on that? Any new developments? There is more research and, and people, uh, brewers now have that information if they want to use it and say, I want to start looking for hops with, with a high level of geranial or certain uh, thiol compounds. Uh, mentioned before, 4-MMP, 3-MH. And let's start to, to put those together in different ways. Um, and, and the next step is, is probably understanding where you have the precursors for these so so we focused on three we can see we've got geranial in here it turns out you've got a precursor for geranial so there's a lot more to be understood and as this information goes to the brewers then the brewers who are paying attention uh will be able to use it well interesting i got a question here i've got to ask and we will we could use two hours today if we wanted to totally yeah. but i read again in your hop queries newsletter something really interesting about isomerization and altitude and that's something that I'd, I'd never thought of before. But could you tell us a little bit about that? And uh, is, it, is it a big deal? It's a big deal if you're in Peru. Right. Uh, okay. so, or Denver, maybe. <laughs> so. I, it's, and, and it is. Uh, when we moved from Illinois to New Mexico, and, and so now I'm making beer instead of at 400 feet, at 5,200 feet. And it, it's a really simple solution, and that was just to use about 20% more hops. So that, that's a way to get by at a commercial level, you want to be more exact than that. So, so basically, it's it's the same thing um, that that bakers and cooks have. 
that water mm. boils at a lower temperature, and that really cuts into your isomerization. And, and it can be fairly substantial, right? Where you're looking at sea level, you say sea level is 100%. 100%. If you're at 5,000 feet, you're down to 25% isomerization. Yeah. So it's a big Correct. deal. Correct, yeah, that makes and sense. And if we're, uh, so let's say a brewery in Denver releases yeah. this clone recipe. If a guy, like I think I'm like 1,000 feet where I, where right. I live, uh, there's there's going to be a big difference if I try and copy that, you know. Verbatim. Yeah, you're 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 going to be uh, wondering what happened to some of the enamel on your teeth. <laughs> right. Okay. Good stuff. Way awesome. overhopped. Great. So, Aaron, Brian, and I took a trip this weekend down to Sweetwater to renew our Woodland Circle memberships. Okay. So, and we're enjoying a little Woodland Circle beer here. So, for those who don't know, the Woodland Circle gives members six unique and different bottles of wild sour and barrel aged beers. Plus a lot of other cool perks. The Selim and Nick B really went all out on these beers. They're a big change from your normal Sweetwater brews, okay. Aaron. So offering some cool stuff there. And the memberships are limited. They do have a few left for uh, for the first series. Those are available for one hundred and forty nine dollars. Mm-hmm. The uh, second series is going to start this summer. But uh, details on how to join and Aaron to get a chance to win okay. a circle membership, go to beerguysradio.com. We're going to give away a membership to one lucky winner on April 21st. So we've got more details and info at our website. Check Excellent. It out. Excellent. And we'll be back right after this, talking more with Stan Hieronymus. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show, beerguysradio.com, and we'll be back. Hail South Dakota, a great state of the land. We are Reformation Brewery, celebrating the reformer in you. Locally crafted within the renowned Etowa watershed of Woodstock, Georgia, Reformation creates yeast-forward brews full of aroma and flavor crafted to last. Come see us in beautiful Woodstock, Georgia, for a tour and tasting of unique brews that you can't find anywhere else. Reformation Brewery, set beer free. ReformationBrewery.com the beer guys on facebook twitter and instagram now back to the beer guys radio show oh god here we go again dork alert and welcome back to the beer guys radio show visit us online at beerguysradio.com we are live at monday night brewing in atlanta georgia today and we are talking all things hop all Plural. things hops exactly with stan hieronymus and we're drinking all things hops too we are. So we're drinking a lot of hops today so brian i think you had some questions for mr hieronymus and this, this goes back, I do, in fact, thank you. Uh, this goes back to the, the homebrewing days and something we realized that we enjoyed a great deal. Why is it that first wort hopping seems to produce a preferable hop bitterness to more traditional bittering, even though it actually results in 5 to 10% higher level of measured bitterness? So there have been very few studies about this. Um, the, the Germans did some a, a little more than 20 years ago when they looked back to hopping practices more than 100 years ago. And this led to some confusion with American home brewers because the idea was people would say, I'm going to take this amount of hops that I added in my, quote, flavor edition about 10 minutes ago and put it at the beginning. When you do that, you are not adding flavor. You're taking out flavor because that's no longer there, and you are isomerizing the hops, it's and you're getting more bitterness. Yeah. But what you are getting is because it's an added hop load and your hop choice makes an immense difference. You're generally doing this with land, land race hops, which some people call noble hops, a, a term that was simply invented by people selling hops. I really like people selling hops, except when they say noble hops. <laughs> noble hops. Um, are you saying land raised hops? Land raised hops are, are basically, so Saz, Hallertau, Middlefrew, Hersbrucker, uh, they, there's no breeding involved. Okay. Uh, ex- except. Right. What We're not talking naturally. these sea bearing hops, right? No, no. The, the aquatic hops or <laughs> yeah. hops at sea. No. Yes. So, so, so it is. You can talk about land race uh, barley varieties as well. Okay. So basically, what that means is you walked out there and you said, "I like the hops on this side of the road better than I like the hops on that side of the okay. road." Okay. So they're not so, developed, yeah, exactly, in a, in a university somewhere doing a yes. bunch of different uh, so they, experiments. It, yeah. the, these are the ones, and and they are all of that Euro- European quality. So they don't have the geranial. They don't have those nasty thiols that we love so much now in, in uh, double dry hopped IPAs. Right. So they're that softer. They also have a different polyphenol, which is mouthfeel, which is what the people, that's why red wine is sold as being good for you. So mm-hmm. it's a polyphenol. They have a lot more polyphenols. Hersbrucker, for instance, has like 28 polyphenols that you don't find in any other hop. You're using that at first wort and bittering, even to get to like. 18 BUs, you're using a lot more. So you're adding that mouthfeel, and that helps soften 
the, the load on your tongue. It's also, um, it, it's, I, get, I guess basically it's the polyphenols and, and softening on your tongue. So it, it becomes a uh, more pleasant bitterness. You know, I'd like to think that I'm a fairly knowledgeable home brewer. And then we talk to you and I realize I know nothing, Stan. This is a, there's, this is a master There's class, so though. much there's more out there to learn. I mean, there is a lot of science to it. And, and that's one thing I think that's cool about brewing is you can do it on a simplistic level. But you can also get, you know, extremely deep into it uh, with everything that's going on. So... Um, Stan, we had just a ton to talk to you about, but uh, if you're open to it, we'd love to have you back in the future to talk a little more in depth. But uh, uh, you bring beer, you pour the beer, I'll be. Here. We Done. can do that. Done. We can handle that. But you're going. You mentioned a festival in St. Louis uh, later this year that sounds a little cool. L for the ages. Oh yeah. Uh, um, so ales for the ages is actually in Williamsport, okay, uh, Virginia, and that is end of October. Okay. And there I'm going to talk about the sexual habits of hops and how they change beer and change beer again. Okay. Next week I'll be in St. Louis for the Historic Lager Festival. Historic Lager Festival. Which, which cool. are mostly recipes that Ron Pantinson has provided to breweries across the country, like Firestone Walker did one, Mecklenburg did one, uh, Urban Chestnut did one, some breweries that people may not have heard of, like Dovetail in Chicago, right. uh, Beerstadt in Denver, and, who are making phenomenal beers um you know they, they they've gone and, and brewed some of these uh recipes which may be from 150 years ago or they may be from 50 years ago and for those not familiar with ron pattison he is just a fountain of knowledge on european beer and he's done some just amazing historical research on uh, the beer and the recipes of that so uh stan thanks again for joining us if people want to keep up with what's going on uh in the world of beer in the world of hops what's the best way for them to do that well you can go to appalachianbeer.com where i blog occasionally but there you'll also if, if you really care about hops you can click on there where it says hops newsletter and you can get hops queries and i try and get that out once a month with so it, it sort of moved that instead of doing it on the blog um, I know I'm talking to people who are totally crazy. Interested like in what's yes. coming there, right? <laughs> Excellent. Stan Aramis, thank you so much for joining thank us you. on the Beer Guys Radio Show. Appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and uh, take a quick look or take a quick turn. You talked to uh, Columbus Beer Bash, uh, the folks absolutely behind that. That's right. So. And uh, we're going to hear about what's up with that festival, the second annual Columbus Craft Beer Bash. And we are on with John DeCesar. John is with Cerrone's Brick Oven Pizzeria in Columbus, Georgia, and they are hosting the second Columbus Craft Beer Bash. John, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you so much for having me this morning. Good morning, Joel. So we've got the Columbus Craft Beer Bash, and this is your second annual one. You did the first one last year. Tell us a little bit about this festival. Yeah, this is a, this is a fun event. Really, it's, it's a local event, so we, we try to make everything as local as possible. Giving back to one, a local nonprofit, and Taj Humane, they're, they're a charity sponsor with us. Um, so we can kind of uh, raise money for them and awareness to them. That's really the one of the main goals. But it, it just has to do with local bands, local music, local food. So we're totally into Georgia. We, we love Georgia. We want to keep everything as local as possible. And, and that's another thing that, that makes this event really great is local beer, local food, local music. And it's all local. You're featuring all Georgia breweries at the event, correct? Correct. Yeah, we, as of right now, last year, we I think we had a total of 15 or 16 Georgia breweries attend this this year we have a total of 27, maybe 28 Georgia breweries attending, so it's very large on the brewery end. Excellent. And we've had a lot of uh, new Georgia beer here over the last year or two, so uh, a lot more options down there. And I, I believe some of them don't always make it down to Columbus, correct? That is correct. Yeah, it's, it's hard, especially uh, if you're if you're in Atlanta or on the outside of the perimeter or, or even above Atlanta, um, say, for instance, even, even uh, Carrollton, where um, Prenersdale Prenners is. They just uh, are now distributing down to Columbus. They're, they're very small as well. And they have, uh, they'll, their core beers will be there, but there'll also be some specialty beers and one offs that they're bringing for the event. Yeah, absolutely correct, Tim. Yeah, there's, there's going to be a hundred plus beers. I think just about every brewery for sure is, is bringing between two and six different brands that they carry. Um, definitely the core brands are going to be some one offs, some specialty beers that are in the cask. Uh, so, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of new stuff uh, that maybe you won't be able to get because they could be cask or one off. But at the same time, it would be really, really delicious tasting beers and at least let you kind of know, okay, this is what this brewery can do and what they're about. So that's going to be fun in itself. Awesome. And as you mentioned, outside of the beer, which is, I mean, that alone is enough of a reason to attend. But there's going to be several food vendors there, uh, live music. You have a couple of uh, local bands that will be there playing. So, you know, there's a lot going on uh, the day, just a full 
day of entertainment, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, touch on the, the bands. We have like Dustin Castello, which he's a, a fantastic performer. He has I mean, thousands and thousands of followers. Uh, I believe I, I believe he's competed on American Idol, didn't quite make it. I think he got to the first or second round somewhere in there. But uh, he's, he's a local guy, and he's a good-hearted guy, great music. Uh, then we have a band that's pretty new called Exit 12, and they're going to be opening up for us. As far as food goes, there's going to be uh, Sloan's Brick Oven Pizza. Um, of course, we, we hosted it last year, and we're doing it again this year. So if you love New York-style pizza, it's definitely where to get it. We are having famous Nate's food truck, tacos, hot dogs, burgers. Um, Fairbanks Pharmacy, Pharmacy is coming out as well. They're a farm-to-table type of restaurant. Uh, so you're going to have a food truck. And, then, of course, we have the Tro- uh, Trivoli's Italian Kitchen. They're going to join us again. Uh, doing some twists on sandwiches and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, if you're hungry, there's going to be food. If you love listening to live music, there's going to be two live bands. Awesome. And this is all happening on Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, correct? Correct. Yeah. We, what better day to have a, uh, have a beer festival than on Cinco right. de Mayo? So we just think it's going to pretty much catapult and capitalize everything just that day alone. Is uh, is appealing and, and appeasing to everyone. Okay, and this is at uh, Chattahoochee Harley Davidson from 12 to 5 p.m. And tickets are on sale now. If you buy your ticket before April 23rd, they're twenty five dollars. They are twenty five dollars be- before the 23rd, which is an absolute steal. There, I don't think there's a beer festival right now uh, going on anywhere that's selling their tickets for twenty five dollars. So you definitely need to scoop them up because uh, after the 23rd, they do become thirty dollars. Um, and I think that thirty dollars is going to last to the day of event. So it, it will stop at thirty, but twenty five right now is, is a heck of a deal. Yeah, tw- twenty five is an insane deal. I mean, we're seeing a lot of events happening where we're forty, fifty, or even up to you know sixty or seventy dollars. So unlimited beer uh, responsibly, uh, as much as you can responsibly drink for uh, twenty five dollars. That's a uh, that's that's a lot uh, less than you'd spend on an average night out, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is going to be some food cost involved, but the food's going to be reasonable, like last year. So you're not going to come out here and spend tons and tons of money unless you just want to pig out. But okay. it's it's definitely affordable to all. Twenty five bucks. I mean, you should be able to do that. That's a great deal, especially for again for a beer festival with this many breweries and food vendors attending. Great. And John, where would people go if they want to get tickets for the event? So you want to go to Columbus Beer Bash dot brownpapertickets.com. It'll send you to the direct site link. Excellent. John DeCesaris, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about the Columbus Craft Beer Bash. And thanks, Tim, for that. Uh, You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. That's going to do it for this week. Coming up next week, we'll be on the road once again, Tim. We're going to be broadcasting from the Classic City Brewfest in Athens, Georgia. Be sure to subscribe to us, though, by the way. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Beer Guys Radio. And, of course, uh, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And, again, leave a review. It's a really big help for us. Once again, that's going to do it for this week. Beer Guys Radio, beerguysradio.com. Don't forget to drink local. Cheers. Cheers.